Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast. I'm ready. 7.50, 7.50 a.m. But you do you know what time it is? Uh, 7.50 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's also time for the Barber's Brief. It is. So welcome back, everybody, to another episode of our Barber's Brief. Coming to you live from, or recorded from, Calgary. <laughs> I'm V. Kind of live. <laughs> kind of live. Pseudo live. Uh, if you're a new listener, welcome. This is a forum that we just use to discuss what's caught our eye in the last couple of weeks. We also like to highlight our marketing moment. We get into an audience Q&A and uh, out of the week. If you're a subscriber, thank you for coming back and, uh, and keeping uh, keeping um, keeping us in your ears. Is that, is, can we say that? I guess we can kind of say that. It depends how you're watching or where you're listening. But mm-hmm. yeah, thank you. I think that works. Yeah. Thanks Good morning, for keeping Mark. us in your ears. <laughs> Thanks morning. For <laughs> <laughs> the morning show with Mark and me. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we should go radio. We should go radio. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyone out there wants like two charismatic hosts that don't know what they're doing? Just put that out in the universe. <laughs> Let's get a vision board ready for this one. I mean, yeah, if you dream it, it'll yeah. happen, right? Yeah. In the news. What have you seen this week? Okay. This is a really big headline, honestly. Um, and when I came across it, I, I, don't, I immediately was like, had to do a double take. But it sounds like the House panel unanimously approved a bill that could ban TikTok um, in the United States. Dun, dun, That's dun, crazy. Dun, dun, dun. That's, That's crazy. That's crazy. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. What's happening, right? So here's some like, here's the TLDR. Um, House panel approves the bill to ban TikTok from U.S. app stores unless it's divested by BitDance. Now, it's given BitDance 165 days to sell TikTok or face banning from all app stores here in North America. Now, who is BitDance? BitDance is a Chinese internet technology company that's headquartered in Beijing and incorporated in the Cayman Islands. Now, it was founded by Zhang Yiming, uh, Lian Rubo, and a few others back in 2012. And it's really known for developing essentially the service, the social media uh, services like TikTok, uh, Douyin, as well as news platform. To, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher this and I apologize. If I'm, I'm surprised you're getting this far with all those things. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you had me at TikTok. <laughs> Tweet Tiao? Is that, that could be it. I don't know. But... That sounds about right. <laughs> So they have about 1.9 billion monthly active users across all its platforms, which is just incredible. But the company has faced scrutiny in various countries over security, surveillance, and censorship concerns. So add a new one to the list, the United States. Now, this legislation targets TikTok due to its concerns about the Chinese government spying risks. I think yeah. we've heard that on and off in the news. So like that's not something new. Um, now, what TikTok is doing on, on the flip side, they're really mobilizing its user base against the bill, claiming it violates free expression. The bill could also actually restrict TikTok traffic or content from being carried by internet hosting services. So this mm-hmm. is like, it's cutting really deep into the way mm-hmm. a lot of these platforms work, or in TikTok in this case. Um, USA officials fear China could use TikTok for data and intelligence purposes. The bill is also facing criticism for potentially infringing on free speech rights and impacting tech companies like Apple and Google. So you can understand like Apple and Google are on the, you know, they're on the the sidelines there right now, but they're probably really piqued the interest on what's followed here. Mm -hmm. Obviously more to come. Maybe we'll revisit this in 165 days. I don't know, but it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's a huge platform. Yeah. And I don't know what to think about this, to be honest with you. Yeah, well, and I also wonder how much of this is going to continue to happen. Like, because there's all these internet companies that have, I know there's yeah. laws specifically for where data is held. Like, and and even employees, I used to work at a company where if you had, if you're going to implement a, a an ERP, as an example, right. the staff that was going to do that in the United States had to live in the United States and the data has to live in the United States. So there's there's more of these like, digital boundaries that are being established i think as you get these global companies that are starting to have a footprint and and sort of 
if you want to call it tentacles, um, mm. into different countries. And so I, I get the point. I mean, there's concern about Me too. bad actors and stuff. TikTok is just such a big channel that it's like it has a huge potential impact. Okay, I got one. You ready? What do you got? Yeah, yeah, yeah from uh, from Mark Ritson. Um, Ooh, who's he? The one, <laughs> the one true measure of marketing effectiveness: time. I thought it was a good yeah. article. He, go ahead. I was just gonna say when I saw Time, I'm like, Time Magazine. I'm like, oh yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was interesting. It was a good. It was a well written article. He talks about Cal Ripken and about like him as a baseball player. He had the longest. Uh, I think active playing streak, how many games he played in rows, like 17 yeah, years or something. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And so part of what made him great is his longevity. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think you get into these scenarios with marketing where you've got, you know, short term results, deliver, deliver, deliver. How about today? How about today? How about today? Totally. Get me something now. Get me something now. And so you fail to look at time as a function of effectiveness. And I think that like that really is the ultimate um component that he's talking about he talks a little bit about mm -hmm. um the promise sorry the uh, brand valuation from interbrand the way that they structure that is that you look at current period sales you assess how much of those sales are driven by brand as opposed to other right. factors and then you use a calculation to assess how sustainable the brand strength is over time and it's so it's kind of a net present value uh, calculation okay um anyway so I just thought it was really interesting. And so brand is really important. We talk about short term, long term all the time. Right. Balance ultimately is is really, I think, the message uh, as far mm -hmm. as the takeaway here. Yeah. And then it reminded me of a study or report I saw from Caparo. So you look at something like Interbrand, you go, yeah, okay, fine. That's good for Coke. But what about me? I'm a company that's like, say, 10, 15, 30 million dollars. I'm not Coke. I don't have Interbrand kind of money. Mm hmm. And so this this study that I saw from Comparo, um, you could look at this on your own and just take a look at your Google search traffic. And so the way right. that you have a default setup on the search traffic, you can often will default to say direct traffic, stuff coming from Google, stuff coming from social, display, other, right. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you sometimes you might split it up by channel, like paid, paid channels, organic channels, that kind of thing. But if you take a look at how to, the brand keywords, so direct traffic, organic, like branded keywords, paid or non-paid, and you label them, relabel them as brand. And then you look at things like paid Facebook traffic or anything else. Mm -hmm. The brand, new definition of brand, you can actually see how much of your traffic is coming from your brand. I, yeah, I love this. <laughs> I love this because I, it's funny because I'm, I'm, we're going through this exercise internally right now and just like looking at SEM in traditional sense to, for it to mean more than just um, paid, right? Mm -hmm. It's SEO and PPC together make search engine marketing, right? Mm -hmm. And creating that one unique view, I think does create um, a better understanding of how your, your brand is being present. So yeah, this, well, this is that study that compared is just a study that keeps on giving by the way. Yeah. 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 They're and, smart guys. And I know you have it written here too, but like immediately when I saw this, my mind did go to PTTC. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and I think it's a, go ahead. No, no, go for it. No, I was just going to say, I think it's the, the idea that, you know, when you have, when you make that promise to the customer that you are consistently, it takes time to deliver against that promise. Right. Totally. And what is that? That's time. And yeah. 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 I think there's just, there's a lot there. And like, if, for, if nothing else, just yeah. look at your returns over time, <laughs> you know, like yeah. look at the impact totally. you're making over time, look at your reach over time, look at, you know, whatever it is, but don't just look at now. Yeah. And man, like the short termism, it is a thing like, and it's hard to steer away from it mm -hmm. as long as you can kind of make, make sure that people understand the value of time and building consistency being you know really really thorough in that in that kind of like mindset um i think will make make us just better but we can't really curb that 
that idea of short termism. It's really hard to kick that habit that a lot of organizations are are focused on. Yeah, I, and I don't think it's necessary even to curb it. I just mean to put balance into it. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. All right, what else you got? I got some stats, 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 stats. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear the stats, 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 stats. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Kantar actually issued, um, uh, d just a few, uh, there's five, the five main stats out of a recent study that they did. So this is very UK based, but I still thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. So first one, one in four UK ads feature women over 40 and mm -hmm. just over a quarter of 28% or 28% of UK ads featured women along, um, the age 40 in 2023. This marks a significant increase, uh, the year prior, which is now closer to one in five, about 21%. So it's interesting to see like kind of like the, you know, the, the, the gender and the age is, 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 is kind of moving diversity, diversity yeah. and it's not just, you know, just young, young women that are being prominent. Um, second uh, stat I have here for you, high quality professionally made video kind of drive 60% higher recall for the advertiser, for the advertising it appears alongside versus non-professional content. Mm -hmm. So this is just essentially speaking to how the products or how the services are coming through in the, in the ads themselves. Um, that's that, sorry, that continues to highlight people are also 44% more likely to trust an advert within a professional content setting and 39% more likely to find the advertising entertaining. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for me, this is a little bit, I would, I want to dig into this a little bit more. But I think it's interesting that, um, you know, uh, professional content still outperforms non-professional. What yeah. does that mean for influencers that you're usually just putting a camera on their face and they're just talking? I mean. Yeah. Or like your company, hire an influencer if they're really good at it, I suppose. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Um, the, actually, I just made a small mistake. That previous one was actually ads viewed in the living room have a highest chance of ad recall, which then speaks to the professional uh, ad units versus non-professional ad units. Oh, I see. Yeah. So for me, it was just more around the context that if you're watching ads or watching this in living room setting, it's probably going to resonate a lot more with your audience. And it also has to do with the screen sizes as well. Um, mm -hmm. It's just something to be said that when you're watching it on a TV, there's likely probably that uh, the benchmark is larger for recall. So my apologies. That was a, I forgot to highlight probably the key point of that. Um, the, I'll, I'll put them all in our, in our show notes, but I'll just end with uh, one more here. So, and this one is a little controversial because I'd love your take on it, but consumers are more likely to buy a brand that donates to charity. Uh, so survey says, you know, just under half 45% of consumers say they're more likely to buy a brand if they're advertising uh, if an advertiser will donate to a charity, a very small proportion of 5% say that it's such, uh, such an ad is actually makes them less likely to buy it from the brand while a significant chunk of consumers. So 36% say that it makes no difference to their purchase decision. I know we talk about purpose and, you know, an organizer's purpose and how does that resonate with consumers? I thought this was an interesting one. Um, I don't, I don't think I look for if a if they donate anywhere, like it's not yeah, no. search quickly first. Yeah. It's nice to know maybe that they do, but it doesn't. And for me at least. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, for me, I would say like, I, I don't, I don't know if in an ad you would put, Oh, and we also donate to charity. You know what I mean? Like I, it's, I think maybe the way this survey was set up that you get that result. I think given, you know, things being equal, like if you yeah. have the choice to pick between, I don't know, Nike and Adidas. Totally. And Nike donates to charity, but Adidas doesn't. Sure. I'll buy from Nike. But I, like, you know what I mean? Like it's not the deciding factor for me. No, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. What do you got next? Um, there's this really interesting survey from Marketing Week. Again, it's UK based. So there's, um, it's a employee and engagement survey kind of thing. And so one of the things they talked about is that marketing teams are increasingly outsourced. And so um, there's a few common roles that are being outsourced, 28% digital marketing, followed by content, PR, research, and media. Mm -hmm. uh, 
outsourcing is more prevalent in B2B than B2C. 53% of B2B companies do the outsourcing and 40% of B2C companies do. Uh, but the reasons why is that um, almost half of the people surveyed said that it's because they lack skills in-house. Uh, about a third said that they don't want to hire a full-time employee. Uh, almost a third also said that the team size itself with inside the organization is shrunk. And sure. then the, about 10, 15% said it's a cost saving measure. So it's just interesting. Yeah. It's just an interesting. Well, cause if you, if you're not paying full-time benefits in the full comp plan, oh, even at full-time hours and somebody who's a contractor would, would be, would cost less. Sure. Um, Anyway, it was just one of those interesting ones around like the the function and this and the way that marketing teams are organized uh, and the structure of the teams. It seems that it's increasingly becoming dependent on external resources. I mean, I look at the first one there. So 48.7%, so call it nearly half site, the lack of skills in-house. My quick argument would be like, well, then hire for that skill set in-house. Yeah. I mean... Like what's, what's stopping you from getting that skill set? Now, if it's cost and, you know, some of the other things that you're highlighting here, like the cost savings element, okay, I could, I could understand that. <clears throat> but I think there's more than qualified uh, practitioners out there right now. Um, just think about like all the numerous layoffs that are continuously happening in the tech space um, yeah. that could, would benefit some of these organizers by, you know, landing some of that talent. But yeah. Um, I do understand. I see like 28% here, digital marketing. I get that. Um, it is, it can be somewhat, um, for those that aren't close enough to it, kind of daunting task. And you kind of want to be hands off and just let me know how things go and tell me how much you need me to spend, et cetera. So it's, it's a different approach, but yeah, the, the, what's your take on it being more skewed on the B2B side? Why do you think that's the case? My my suspicion is that marketing in B two B is more um, advanced or less advanced than B two C, and so people I I suspect it's just a, a function of people's comfort of what marketing is and who can do it. Um, it I think for a long time probably in B two B sales was the driver for a lot of organizations, and then yeah, now that you've right. got more and more consumers that want to have a direct click to one click purchase kind of thing, like an Amazon style experience, um, you know, fewer interactions with salespeople. There's a question around what are the right skills we need for the the marketing side of things, and probably specifically sure. digital marketing and creating these digital sales experiences for for buyers to make it easier to buy. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, I, I think in some cases, B2B organizations just don't know where to start. And so sure. you bring in somebody that can help you start that. I think that's a fair point. Okay. What do you got next? Oh, this is really more localized here for, for Canada, but, um, the, the Canadian marketing association or also known as CMA unveils plans for its inaugural C CMA marketing week to help drive in industry innovation. So from uh, May 6th to 9th here in um, 2024, they've partnered with Google to kind of put on uh, an event that will feature perspectives from over 20 different industry experts, uh, thought leaders uh, with sessions and events that will hold, that will be both in person and, and virtually. It will be based in, in Toronto. Cool. Uh, the, the agenda itself will focus on the marketing profession with focus on future focused lens. So it'll be industry challenges and, you know, for the Canadian consumers. Um, it will also offer free learning and networking opportunities for marketers as well. And the week in totality really aims to help marketers deliver on today's business needs um, while preparing for the future marketing in, in Canada. So I'm sure you'll mm -hmm. hear a lot about AI. I'm sure uh, mm -hmm. it's going to be uh, a, a topic that will be deeply rooted but i think it's interesting that it's taking a real canadian approach because i think that's something that there's kind of been lacking mm -hmm. uh, for the most part in the in a little bit in over the years here so that's good to see that initiative coming from the cma so cool yeah yeah that's a good one yeah i'm gonna check that out for sure i didn't know anything about that one so i'll have to look into that uh v yo who's gonna be the next richest country in the world 
This is Greece. it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> why are you laughing? I love how we both laughed. <laughs> uh, I don't know if this is like this is a sensational headline, but El Salvador could become one of the richest nations in the world. Um, I don't know oh. if you remember this, but a bunch of years ago, uh, like in 2021, not a bunch, but like three. <laughs> <laughs> Three years ago, a bunch of years ago. Well, that's a bunch, <laughs> a few, more than a couple. <laughs> so they became the first country in 2021. They became the first country to accept Bitcoin as legal tender, and then they hired or hired. They elected a new president uh, who had. He's a millennial guy. He got really into Bitcoin uh, as a currency for the for the country. Okay. He he made a plan, a part of their national strategy on on um, economic development to invest in one bit buying one bitcoin a day so okay. they started and they've now accumulated over two thousand bitcoins uh, which is valued at about 150 million dollars and you've probably seen the bitcoin price going up and up and up recently yeah so it's hit new highs anyway so the country views it as digital gold um rather than having gold reserves they've got bitcoin reserves jesus yeah, and so it's really interesting for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, but a large percentage of El Salvadorians don't have access to traditional banking services. So Bitcoin mm -hmm. and just the ecosystem of purchasing and making transactions online and all those things that come with it mm -hmm. um, gives them access to global financial markets that they've never had before. Um, for me, uh, we're going to tease this later, but we had Ari, Dr. Ari, Dr. T. All right. Dr. Uh, Sun. <laughs> Mr. Dr. Mr. T. I phonetically pronounced Tanu Sanjaya. <laughs> yeah. Um, we had him on from Nuremberg Bass Institute talking about physical availability. And as I was reading this yeah. story, I'm like, oh, this is kind of really interesting. Like how you pay for things is part of physical availability. And so yeah, it's I know point. Bitcoin has been a, a thing, but it's El Salvador is one of those like extreme cases. Like you get zeros and tens and you learn a lot from those. And I think seeing how El Salvador is creating this infrastructure and how payments are made to access totally. goods and services is something interesting to think about um, for planning out, you know, strategies in the next couple of years. So I, I just thought that I mean, was really interesting. Yeah. Sorry. And I thought your question was like rich in history. That's why my mind went to Greece. But uh, <laughs> trying to save face now <laughs> all my Greek listeners out there sorry please love you all it is very rich in history it's got great food great people <laughs> great islands there's so many great things you're just saying that because I'm here that's okay no I got all my pictures behind me here there's, that's true. I love that place uh, case study right. Case study, marketing moment. So going back a bunch of years, well, last year, um, July <laughs> 2023, <laughs> uh, there was an ad from the Women's uh, World Cup that generated a lot of attention. I don't know if you remember, says, remember this, but it was called essentially Les Bleus. And um, from the, it was, I don't think, it's funny because I don't think anyone remembered who was the the advertiser. But it was really, really, um, it was really prominent because it kind of showcased essentially the highlights of women's French football uh, mm -hmm. to the national team, who is known as Les Bleus, and it calls it the prejudice against women's football in the same light. So the French telco Orange was the one behind it. So okay. quick, some background. The format basically uses a highlight reel format to popularize of popular among football fans. So usually mm -hmm. you see that for big games or, you know, when they're advertising for Champions League and things like that, just like a lot of the the skills that, you know, from the men's team have. Mm -hmm. um, it initially appears to be a standard sizzle reel match uh, highlighting the men's French team, which is featuring like uh, Kylian Mbappe, Antonio, uh, sorry, Antoine Griezmann. But halfway through the ad, it's revealed that the players are actually french female from uh, the natural mm. uh from their national team and it altered the look of their male counterparts by using the visual effects so while it was essentially um there's a lot of cgi that happened in 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 that um in that video it actually 
shifted the focus to say like you can essentially watch the women's game as well to get the same action so to speak hmm. so the ad emphasized that only les bleus or the men's team can invoke such emotions but the viewers have just seen that the women's team is challenging those stereotypes and perceptions yeah so the spot ends with like at orange we support les bleus uh we support um which encompasses both the the masculine and feminine spellings of the word so it was kind of like um kind of a play on words as well okay so in an interview with marcel uh this uh, the cso uh and cso sorry i'm gonna i'm gonna butcher this name here we go but uh gislain uh tenenson oh that's really good get, i think so i don't know i, I think it <laughs> i'm gonna great. get corrected somewhere yeah. An Orge's hint of advertising and retail communication, mm -hmm. Quentin Delabel, they shared that amid the sea of sub brands and cheap telcos, Orange has maintained its market leadership by having that strong positioning on top quality and reliability. And they're attributing a lot of that to the success of the campaign. Mm -hmm. The campaign's positive tone was core to the brief, and it was essential to drive support without seeing, uh, seeming judgmental of the audience. Um, the idea behind the campaign was banking on the passion of seeing great moments and skill that unite football fans, whether that be, mm -hmm. you know, um, men or, or, or women. Mm -hmm. And I have to say in Europe, women's sport is a lot more popular than I think it is here in North America. And it's just huh. by nature of, you know, the, the, the club alliance that people have to their teams. So anytime mm. your team is playing, it doesn't matter if it's men or women, like people. Will yeah. It's your team. Them. Yeah. Exactly. So All right, I was going to say, <laughs> sorry, no, go, I was going to say, there, there's, there seems to be, and I know you got results coming up, but there's, there yeah. is this movement, like there's that volleyball, I forget if it's Nebraska or American um, mm. college team, but they broke like an attendance record for a volleyball game. It was a women's yeah. vo volleyball team. And then totally. like the women's uh, soccer league, like they've, created equal pay or, or at least the national teams yeah. uh, in yeah. states there's a lot of really awesome things happening with women's sports there's a female hockey league now a professional hockey yeah. league there's so many great things happening there it's it's good to see that well actually the prof the professional women's hockey league actually their their main sponsor so molson i don't know if you saw this that's made made a lot of news that could have been a news that we had but instead of having their last names at the top of the jerseys that is usually covered by their hair, they chose mm -hmm. to put their logo there instead and move the the players' oh. names to the bottom of the jersey, which huh. is just kind of like a nod to we. Uh, sorry, and the 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 uh, the headline was we covered our name so we can see yours or something oh, to that cool. effect, which is really cool because I think. I, I love this, this movement, if you will, of really empowering women and, and mm -hmm. women in sport and, and it becoming more, uh, I don't know, more prominent than it's ever been. And I yeah. think it's, I think it's great. And this, this campaign that happened last year, I think was just another way to kind of look at that. Yeah. So just quickly from a results perspective, the ad was viewed over a hundred million times, uh, media coverage generated over 400 articles is what they were able to uh, help really kind of expand the reach there. They also had the the ad itself was mentioned in TV primetime uh, and it was getting a lot of organic buzz that way. Buzz, I know we traditionally will hate that word. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I think I think this is one of those campaigns where you want the buzz uh, as much as possible. And it was shared on social media by even the, like the French Minister of Sports and the World Cup athletes, um, men and women alike. And it was, I think it was just a great uniting um uh, anthem if you will for sport in general and they're not to be that prejudice that that usually skews on the male side so that's why i'm it could have been easily at the end of the week but i think there's more here that kind of warranted it to be highlighted as a marketing moment yeah that's a cool story i really like that yeah i think yeah, I um yeah, well, we were told talked about the U.S. version of that, but it's I think it's it is awesome. Like, and with having two girls, like it's great having all these uh, icons sort of like propped up, totally. and yeah, I love it. I have my niece uh, who's in in Greece, and she's really taken to basketball, and um, of course, like I'm her coach, so to speak, uh, from across the, <laughs> across the pond. And what I love about it is like she's looking for female. Um, uh, athletes to kind of model her game after it's not just mm -hmm. like the men's game 
Yeah. You know, one that came, comes to mind right now is like Caitlin Clark. Um, and she, mm -hmm. she really went just the way Caitlin plays. My niece is like, that's the style I want to play. Right. Hmm. And I love that because it is getting national coverage again and it's getting people excited to watch a game or watch, you know, the March madness that's coming up here very quickly. Totally. So anyways, uh, all the women in sport keep going. You guys are doing great things. Next okay. audience Q and a, what, uh, what do you got? So I got one, uh, from James. Here's a question okay. for you, V. If you're not optimizing for traffic, how do you measure ad impact? How do you measure ad impact? In other words, brand. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> I, I, for me, it's like, these are almost like two different questions. Like if you're not optimized for traffic, how are you to measure for ad impact? I would say like, how do you, you don't need the first part. You can say, how do you measure ad impact? Right. Usually it'll be things like well, sales. Obviously it depends what your ad is trying to do, but like it could be sales. It could be lead generation. It could be whatever. And that's how you would measure your impact. Mm -hmm. Then you can look at on-site metrics like dwell time, you know, bounce rates, et cetera. I don't, I mean, if you're optimizing the traffic for those, whatever the outcome of the ad is, I think that's where you're just continuously going to be driving, you know, again, more revenue, more leads or whatever the yeah. outcome is. But that, I think that, I don't know. I, I feel like there's a gotcha coming. So that's why I'm a little hesitant. No, to, there's no, no, there's no gotcha. Oh. It's just, <laughs> no. And, and like, this is during a conversation that I had. Uh, so that wasn't okay. the actual like way necessarily he said it, but it's just how I interpreted it and remembered it. Um, okay. Yeah. It was kind of like, well, in other words, how to measure brand, like, cause traffic yeah. is easy to show and it's easy to manipulate. Yeah. Right. Like you can go get a whole bunch of traffic. That's not qualified that you'll actually, the, the downstream effect will be, you're not driving the revenue that you need to be driving, even though you can say, look at the impression volume or the traffic I drove, I, I did my job. I think for us as practitioners, especially in the media space, you have to make sure you're finding those qualified audiences. So at the end of the day, it's identifying or how you're leveraging your first party data to model or find those lookalike audiences from, from the, you know, every platform to make sure that you can drive high quality traffic or high intent traffic mm -hmm. um, based on, again, what is it that you're looking for them to actually do? And if it's sell a product. Point. So that's, that's a good point. I guess that's all. That's so, I so I guess another question would be, the question back would be, how do you know your traffic is good to begin with? And then separately from yeah. that, how do you know, how do you measure ad impact? And there's a whole bunch of other things. I feel like some of the answers are coming from the earlier part of our conversation around looking at traffic sources. And if you even mm -hmm. classified it in a brand and other, yeah, there's probably something there too. Yeah. The other side is like, if you're new, if you're a new company, um, what well, you have to start doing. So if you're a startup, you're just, you know, really starting to get in that space. How do you know if your traffic is good? First of all, you look at benchmarks that exist in the industry. So for your specific vertical, what does it look like, say from a, you know, uh, a meta perspective or, you know, yeah. whatever those are, and you can kind of gauge what that looks like for you. Yeah. And then I think over time you'll, establish your own benchmarks um, yeah. because those should only be used directionally because everyone's a little bit nuanced and there's some, there are some differences, but then you start building your own benchmarks and those will constantly shift and change and they yeah. should be shifting and changing as you get better at identifying those high intent audiences, your targeting strategies change. Um, yeah. You'll be able to kind of keep moving that needle. But I would, uh, you know, immediately, if I'm setting up something new from, from the beginning, I would just use industry benchmarks to kind of aim for, and then just test and learn, test yeah. and learn. It, yeah. There's no well, I guess there's also learning. another, there's also another part there, which is why do you assume that web traffic is the only thing that's good? That's true. That's true. I, another example, I think, I don't remember who said this, but um, they were saying, I think it actually was Chris Walker. And he was saying that one of his biggest for his company has his biggest lead gen uh, platforms actually became his podcast. Yeah. But the podcast doesn't show up in any traditional metric. Right. Right. 
but it comes from surveys that they're doing. So they're getting that pulse that, yeah, you know, for example, this is a new yeah. way of generating leads or visits essentially for the product yeah. that's coming through it. Like self-reported attribution. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's yeah. where, again, just you got to just test as much as possible, really. I don't know. Yeah. You think I missed anything there? Yeah. What do you think? Well, it's, it's, I think the reason, part of the reason I want to ask it is because we've asked versions of that question a lot, but yeah, I, I feel like we, I, it, I, I need to have a really succinct answer for it, but some of the answer yes, is just other questions like, yeah, like to your point, well, how do you measure impact at all period? And then why do you think optimizing for traffic is web traffic is the only measure of impact? Like, I think they're, you're right. Yeah. They are different questions and they're not related, but I think that's something that's worth spending a bit more time on for me anyway. Uh, I mean, and I got yeah. added of the week, V. You do have out of the week. What did you yeah. find? Well, I found uh, from System One, they had this, uh, they've got a great catalog of, of great ads um, and they've scored them all. So System One has a scoring system for ad effectiveness it's yeah. out of six. And so uh, part of the Super Bowl string of commercials, one of them was from Pfizer. And um, this one scored 3.8 out of six. And so okay. in comparison to some of the other ads, not as high as mm -hmm. what, like the Amazon ad we talked about before, um, right. not as high as that one. But in comparison to farm ads, this is light years ahead of all the other farm ads. So farm <laughs> ads score on average 2.2 stars. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah, prescription pharma yeah. commercials are an average of 1.3 stars. So in terms of the category benchmarks, this is like a, an anomaly. It's, it's unbelievable. But okay. in general, the ad is really great. Like there's this whole thing about going through a museum. There's some CGI and stuff. It's, it's set to the background of, um, uh, what's that? It's Queen song. Um, Don't stop me now. Okay. Oh, um, and it just goes through like history books and paintings on walls of people who are these old science people. And it's like an ode to science, but then they kind of ended up with this, this really cool thing where it's like onto the next fight. I think the next, the last mm. fight meaning COVID and mm. the next fight meaning a uh, call to action towards uh, cancer. Right. And so it's really well done. It's just a great, I think it's a great ad. I don't know if you'd seen it yet, but I just put it up in the lesson or in the notes this morning, but it's so yeah. good. It's so entertaining and it's so um, impactful and it feels very optimistic, which is mm -hmm. great, especially for, and then the call to action going to the, this new web page they've got. Um, it's just, it's, it's really yeah, it's very, it has a very hopeful feeling, which is, I think for cancer people, it's really, or people going through anyone with cancer. It's awesome. Yeah. Anything that, ha for me, anything that helps drive awareness uh, for cancer, it's something obviously that's, you know, lost people, close people to, to, to this wretched disease. Um, obviously has me, <laughs> has me pulling for them. And even if I, if I, I like this, the tagline here, or maybe it's not the tagline, but like the title, like here's to the next fight. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's almost like a, a very positive tone in the, in the context of like, you know, here, here we go, let's go, let's get, get after mm -hmm. it. So, um, it could almost be like a, a rally cry of sorts. So mm -hmm. no, it's, I did, I did get a chance to quickly watch it and it is, um, it is really well done and mm -hmm. probably like you said earlier, what you wouldn't have expected from uh, from this category mm -hmm. yeah so what do we got coming up next v well we you highlighted earlier but we we actually we had uh, uh dr ari dr t um <laughs> but let's uh, use his proper last name tanu sanjaya uh from the Ehrenberg and bass institute uh talking about physical availability and it was did that conversation for, for me was so refreshing and mm -hmm. if you remember we actually were, for us on a, on a mountain time we were able to record it in the afternoon and i don't know if it was because it was like end of day for us and we were having s such a 
great convo. It just came out so conversational mm -hmm. that I thought it was really, really well done. And so he articulates many great points around the importance of physical availability, how it actually drives a lot of, you know, how it helps essentially build the, your, your brand. And mm -hmm. a lot of people don't associate physical availability with that. Mm -hmm. A lot of great nuggets in there. Look for it next week. It's, um, it's really well done. Yeah. Yeah, it was a really great conversation. And, and like one of those ones, you like, for me, I was like, I think I even said something like this, like somebody who's in uh, logistics is going to go, yeah, dummy. <laughs> but like, yeah, idiot. But, but for marketing, like, I don't think a lot about the physical availability, but it's so important. We like, we should be thinking a lot more about it. It's, it was such a great conversation. You can have the best product available, but if it's not actually available. Yeah. You can, yeah, you can advertise right. the it's shit okay. out of anything, but yeah. <laughs> if you can't, if it's not there, yeah. yeah. So, really so many good, really yeah, good. so many good little case studies in there too. Yeah. <clears throat> oh yeah. This is a gem. All right. So now there's one more thing. Oh, 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 okay. This is not in the script. Let's I know. Go. What is it? Let's go chase profitability. <laughs> <laughs> You pulled a zinger on me, man. I wasn't expecting. I thought it was like another little nugget to say, like, you I'm have pregnant. a sponsor or something. I'm oh, pregnant, wait, B. That's what <laughs> something I've been meaning to tell you. It's not you, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> that's too funny. Awesome. Man. Yeah, yeah. Go chase profitability, everyone. Let's go. Yeah. That's what we do. All right. We'll talk to you soon, right. buddy. Have a great week. All right, bye.